Hello. Good morning. How are you? Hello, hello. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. How are you? Hello. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening or good night. <laughs> Wherever you're watching from planet Earth. Thank you so much for joining me live on Instagram. I appreciate you guys. Awesome. If I can get my phone to be level in my hand here. How's everybody doing? Hi. Hey, hey, hey. I'm doing well today. Thank you for asking. Type in the comments where you're checking in from. That way we all know. Thank you for thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. While you guys are loading up here to watch this brand new walk talk, five lies about tithing, I'm going to go ahead and get my introduction out of the way just in case you're new to my ministry. My name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books so far. They're all available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Check them out if you get some time. Uh, I also have a podcast. The name of my podcast is Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. I'm recording the latest episode live right here on Instagram. And I appreciate you guys joining me for this latest record recording. <laughs> if you're listening to the podcast, please pause it. If you're listening in the future, of course, you can't pause it right now because we're recording this live. But if you're listening in the future, please pause the podcast, leave me a quick review, and then come back and finish watching if you don't mind. All right, I'm also on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, I refurbish these onto YouTube. There's a lot of people on YouTube who watch Walk Talks. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Oh, uh, what else? Uh, what else about me? I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I'm a regular person just like you. The word pastor is only used once in the New Testament epistles, and it's in Ephesians chapter 4. And we see this. Uh, listed, we see no qualifications, we see no authority, we don't even see any duties. So the reason why the pastoral air quotes position is what it is today is because of what began in the first century with Ignatius of Antioch creating the one bishop rule. And then when the Reformation started in the 16th century, Martin Luther and John Calvin took that word and created what we see today because it's non-biblical <laughs> for the past 500 years. We've just been following it along blindly because of man-made tradition. We're supposed to do it by the book, right? Yes. And when we go to the Bible, you don't have to be a pastor to talk about Jesus. <laughs> That's nowhere to be found. And pastors have no authority over you. Pastors have no special hotline. What we see today, pastor, is not even described in the Bible. The word pastor is another word for shepherd, and it's a spiritual gift of overseeing. But we see nothing of what we see today. This is all because of man-made tradition from the first century of Ignatius of Antioch who created the one bishop rule. And then when the reformers did their spinoff from Catholicism and started Protestantism, they started the one pastor rule. So that's why I put that in my introduction. I want to help you renew your mind to just how much God wants to express himself through you, no matter what you know. And <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear those dogs really loud on the podcast, but they're pretty loud in my ear. Um, I apologize about that. Um, let me get past them. Okay, now I can't see you anymore. Uh, give me just one moment. I'll be right back. Hang on. All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, my alarm system actually just went off. <laughs> and I forgot to turn it off, so I had to flip over, turn that off, and come back. Um, okay, so hopefully you guys can hear me. If you can't hear me, just type that in the comment that you can't hear me. Sometimes when uh, disruption happens in the middle of my walk talk and I go over to a different app and then come back, the audio is messed up. So if you can't hear me, uh, just type that in the comments. If not, I'm going to continue. All right, so uh, what else? So, um scanning my Rolodex of what I usually go over for my <laughs> introductions. Now, if you're listening in the future, you can just skip through my introduction. My introduction lasts three to five minutes, just depends on how much I'm talking about each part of the introduction. You can just skip, 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 and wait for me to get to that part that says, let's get to today's walk talk. That's the signal that I'm getting ready to talk about today's walk talk. All right. A um, couple other things. Oh, uh, I don't know everything. So I put that in my introduction because there are some ministries set up on knowing 
everything. Thank you so much. I appreciate you letting me know. Some ministries, they just, they're set up on, I know it all. <laughs> and I never want you to listen to me, watch me, read my memes, read my books, thinking, Matt knows everything. No, I know what I know so far. <laughs> We're all growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You don't have to know everything. You got to know Jesus. And once you've trusted Jesus, he comes and lives in you and writes himself on your heart and mind. And then you are having your mind renewed and you're learning and growing and maturing. Okay. Now, what else? If you want to contact me, um, please don't message me on social media. I understand that the algorithms get triggered in a positive way when you receive messages on Instagram and other platforms. I get that. And I, I do like when the algorithms are triggered, but to be honest with you, I cannot keep up with inbox messages through social media. So I welcome your interaction, but please don't message me on social media. Go over to my contact page on my website and I'll be glad to interact with you there. Now, while you're on my website, be sure to sign up for the free daily devotional and you'll get an email early every morning, a devotional I've written. And if you're listening in the future on the podcast, you can actually pause the podcast and there is a link in the show notes that you can sign up real quick and then come back. All right, so let's get to today's Walk Talk. Five lies about tithing. Now, normally I don't say lies. Rarely you'll hear me say lie. I think I, I think I titled one or two of my walk talks where it says lie. I don't like using that word. I like using the word error, <laughs> okay? Because a lie is when you know something and you know that something is the truth, but then you decide to ignore that, all right? An error is something you don't know, okay? So, I want to always help people understand the good news of the gospel without making them feel attacked. When I wrote my first book, I wrote in a very aggressive, attacking way. And as I matured and wrote my second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh book, about my third book, I really started to understand People will respond to your message if you just do what Peter advises you to do. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect. So those are my goals. I want to express this with gentleness and respect. And I actually went back and rewrote my first and second book to reflect that. And I trimmed the fat, okay? If I ever make you feel disrespected, I'm sorry. If I ever make you feel lower, less than, or if you feel insulted by me, I'm sorry. I never want that from you. Now, uh, you know, I could preface this. I'm a human being. I make mistakes. I have immaturities and sometimes I'm immature. Okay. That's just part of life. I'm not supposed to get on here and, uh, you know, just be a freaking encyclopedia or act like somebody who I'm not. I got to be me, okay? Sometimes I'm immature, so I apologize. So full disclaimer, when you listen to me, I'm not like a lot of the people out there who are trying to appear in a certain way or even have a certain title in order to appear a certain way. I am a regular person just like you. That's all I got to be, okay? Um, so I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. So when I talk about tithing, I understand that this is going to hurt a lot of people's feelings and it's never my goal. So I sometimes get accused of not being gracious enough <clears throat> when I talk about certain things and I don't know what else to do. <laughs> okay. Um, if I'm not gracious enough for you again, I'll, I'll repeat myself. I'm sorry. I, I am attempting to rest and be gracious. Even when I talk about difficult topics, but when we find our identity in man-made tradition, it's going to be insulting and you're going to begin to have questions of what do I do now? Okay. I don't want you to feel insulted. I don't want you to think I am against you. I don't want you to think I'm trying to tear something down. You know, people who really struggle with legalism, they think I attack churches. They think I'm against people gathering at a building. I'm not. <laughs> but when those locations are established on man-made tradition, a lot of the things that I say, they take it that way. 
And Jesus warned against man-made tradition. Paul warned against man-made tradition. But if we just go back to the Bible and read it and not superimpose what we've learned through man-made tradition, there is freedom to enjoy. And I want you to help you, I want to help you enjoy your freedom. When you understand you're free, you get to decide. <laughs> How about that? You get to choose. And that includes tithing. So let's talk about that today. Tithing is taught erroneously and in a um, dishonest way, a lying way quite often because there are some places they know about the tithe. They know the truth about the tithe, but they still teach the opposite of what the truth is because they don't know how they're going to pay their bills. But, you know, we see in Matthew chapter 7 what the Jews had built everything upon apart from faith in Christ, looking to the law for righteousness, begin, uh, getting rich off of cashing in on God's promise from Deuteronomy chapter 8. I will bless you with great wealth and health if you obey my commandments. That was sinking sand. It wasn't on the rock. And they had turned to serving money, not God. And they turned to serving money, not God, because they were looking to law observance to get rich still rather than believing God. But that was a sinking ship. It was saying it was built on sand. Jesus said. So when we talk about these topics about the tithe tithing, <laughs> if you're, if your establishment is built on the tithe and, and then you think, well, if we don't tithe. How will we, how will we survive with all due respect? That's not the ecclesia's problem. You can't establish something on sand, on error, on law observance, and then get mad at the body of Christ because they're not supporting that. It has to be built on the rock, and the rock is the message about Jesus. So if you decide to give 10%, that is your prerogative. If you decide to give no percent, that is your prerogative. <laughs> If you decide to give 30, 40, whatever, there is no law on this side of the cross to give any particular percentage. So we're going to talk about that today. So before I begin, <laughs> oh, I love you guys. Before I begin, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and go over the five lies. This is normally how I do this. So I like lists. If you've listened to any of my past walk talks, which I highly recommend that you do if you want to catch up and kind of see what I'm all about. Listen to my past walk talks. They're on every major podcast platform. They're on YouTube. And I think they're going to help you out. But I like list. So when I do these lists, I'll tell you what the five are or the three or however many I'm doing. And then I'll dive deep into each one. So the first lie about tithing, number one, Malachi 3 proves we are to test God with our tithe so that he will bless us. Okay, I'm going to repeat that so you can soak it in. The first lie, Malachi 3 proves we are to test God with our tithe so that he will bless us. All right. Number two, <laughs> Abraham tithed before the law was given, therefore establishing a principle of the tithe. All right, I'm going to repeat that. Number two, Abraham tithed before the law was given, therefore establishing a principle of the tithe. All right, and I'm going to have to switch hands today. This is camera, cameraman number one. We've got to switch over to cameraman number two. So bear with me. I'm on a break right now. Do, 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 do. We are on a commercial break. It's about 15 degrees or whatever out here. So cameraman number one is cold. I'm going to put him in my pocket and switch. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I know. And this is probably going to happen a few times today. Normally I don't do this because my hand's not so cold, but today is like the coldest day of the year. So let's get set up. Oh, yes. And we're back. All right. So the third lie out of the five lies about tithing, <laughs> the third lie is Luke 11 and Matthew 23, Jesus commands us to tithe. In Luke 11 and Matthew 23, Jesus 
commands us to tithe. It's Luke 11, 42, Matthew 23, 23. Okay. And then number four, when Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what's God's, he was commanding us to tithe. I'll repeat that. When Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what's God's, that was a commandment to tithe. All right. That's the fourth lie. And then the fifth lie. Oh, I got you, McMillan. Hebrews chapter seven. That's on this side of the cross. It's in the epistles and we are commanded to tithe in Hebrews chapter seven. Okay. That's the fifth one. <laughs> Hebrews chapter seven is in the New Testament epistles and we are commanded to tithe in Hebrews chapter seven. All right. So let's get to it. So first of all, what is the tithe? The word tithe literally means 10%. However, <laughs> by the time you do the math on the Jewish calendar, it was 23%. I think it was 23.3%. All right. 23.3%. So if you are tithing biblically, it's not 10 it's 23%. Okay. So what is the tithe exactly? A lot of people are like, oh, it's cash. It's your 10% of your income. It's not. <laughs> All right. So when we look to the Bible for the tithe, the tithe is part of the law of Moses. And the law is 613 different commandments. Part of that was the tithing section. Okay. Now, the tithe was not your income. <laughs> now, let's, let's be clear, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but if you had an overabundance of produce from your harvest and you could not carry it all, you could trade it in for money and then give that money to the treasury, okay? But the tithe was never money unless that was the case. So the tithe was grain, food, fruit, vegetables, grain, spices, cattle. Okay. It was not 10% of your income from your, from your check. Okay. So I'll repeat that. The tithe is grain, spices, cattle. It's your produce. It's your harvest. It's what you have grown. So this is why we see in the Old Testament to give God his first fruits or give God our first fruits. That's true according to the law. But on this side of the cross, since Christ brought in the new covenant, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Christ is our first fruits. So the dividing line of human history is the cross. Before the cross, you had the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, 613 commandments, not just 10. 10 is just the moral part. And Deuteronomy chapter four, verse two says, do not add to the law, do not take away from the law. So it was an all or nothing proposition. Part of the 613 was the tithing commandments. So the tithe was a commandment. You had to give your tithe. The tithe was the food, grain, spices, cattle. Why did the tithe have to be given? What do you think? <laughs> was it to pay pastor's salary? No, that's nowhere to be found in the Bible. Was it to erect a new wing on the church? No, that's nowhere in the Bible. Insert whatever you think the tithe is for. According to scripture, here's what the tithe is for. According to Genesis, excuse me, Nehemiah 13, excuse me, getting ahead of myself here. According to Deuteronomy 14, Deuteronomy 26, Nehemiah 12, and Nehemiah 13, the tithe, here it is. This is what the tithe is for. The tithe is to support the Levitical priests because they weren't allowed to have an occupation because they were doing all the temple work. It was also meant to support Jewish festivals, orphans, and widows. You know, most of the writings that I do and, and uh, most of the uh, things I've written about the tithe, I've only talked about the Levites being supported. But the reality is the tithe is also for the Jewish festivals, 
orphans and widows. It's for the needy. It's for the people who weren't allowed to work or couldn't work or needed help. Okay. It is never listed as something that you give to a church building. Okay. So we're going to talk about that today. Now, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.17, unlike many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Okay, some people will say, oh, you're selling books, you're peddling the word for profit, or um, you're, a, you're a pastor, you're peddling the word for profits, or you're an evangelist, you're peddling the word for profit. The word in context in this section of scripture is logon, L-O-G-O-N. The word is not the Bible. The Bible never refers to itself as the word. It wasn't even compiled until hundreds of years after everything was written. So if somebody says you're peddling the word of God for profit, and then they want to fill in the blank and say, this is you peddling the Bible or using the Bible to make a profit, that is error. So the word logon means that which is said. So Paul is saying we are not peddling that which is said, which is the message about Jesus for profit. Okay, so we also got to get that out of the way. Okay, I got to switch hands again here, guys. I apologize. Normally, I don't have to. But today, I actually wasn't even going to do this walk talk because it's so cold. Where's my other towel? I got one hand towel at the bottom of the phone, so it covers the mic. Oh, man, that's gross. Sorry, guys. And the other one here <laughs> is to blow my snotty nose. All right. And we're back again. Okay. So when Paul said, unlike many, we are not peddling the word of God for profit. He's not talking about selling a book. He's not talking about being a pastor or getting in a ministry or anything that our modern church wants to say. Okay. He's talking about telling people about Jesus. So we are not going around telling people about Jesus for profit. Okay. So we got to get that all the way. Logan. So we, just quick side note right here. I don't have a whole lot of time for side notes today because this is, this is a pretty in-depth walk talk, but the word, the word in scripture never describes the Bible. Okay. The Greek word for the word in scripture, there's several different Greek words. You have logos, which is the word of God. That's Jesus. You have logon, which is that which is said. You also have rhema, which means utterance. And you also have davar, which means the word of God, God actually speaking. And we see that in the Old Testament because Christ hadn't come yet. Okay, so back on track here. Um, the tithe. So the tithe was part of the 613 commandments. A lot of people say, oh, I got you right here, Macmillan. Jesus himself said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Okay, so if you want to go that route and you want to apply the law to yourself. I, I'm not going down that path today because that is a long walk talk in itself and you can just, you can Google, you can YouTube, you can search my website, just type in abolish or the law or anything that has to do with that online and my name and I've talked about it a lot. But let's just do this. If you wanna say, Jesus said I have not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. Okay, if you wanna do that, you gotta do it all. It's a package deal. You don't get to cherry pick what you're going to do. <laughs> you got to do it all or do none. That's why James said in James 2.10, if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. Paul said in Galatians 3.10, you are cursed if you do not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. He also told the Romans, sin will no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. He also told the Romans, the law was brought in so that sin would increase, so that grace would increase even more. So if you want to follow the law, first of all, you got to be Jewish because if you have no Jewish blood, you're not, you're not part of that covenant. Ephesians chapter two says you were without hope in regard to that covenant. You got to have Jewish lineage, but let's just say you are Jewish and you want to follow the law. You got to do it all. Here's another thing though. If you will still want to do it, <laughs> you're going to have to sacrifice an animal at the temple for forgiveness every year but the temple's gone. It was destroyed in AD 70. So when Jesus said that, yes, this was before the cross. He's telling them, I am setting the standard for the law. 
Be perfect like God. He even says that in Matthew 5, 48. So we got to repent from the law toward grace. Are you just saying that we don't have to lit up? I'm saying everything that has to do with the law, it is not for you. The law is not of faith, Paul said. Sin will be afforded through the commandments, Paul said. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians, Romans 7. So this is, if this is new to you, and, and you, this is just, listen to my past walk talks. Okay, let's get back on track here. Okay, so tithing is a matter of the law. Tithing is part of the law. And the law was exclusively for the people group of Israel. Who's Israel? Israel was the people group whom Moses had freed from slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea floor out into the wilderness. Okay. And the law was brought in so that they would realize they need grace in even greater ways because they still had not believed God, even though they saw the Red Sea floor split, even though they had food coming down from heaven, they still did not believe God. So the law was brought in to get them to realize grace in even greater ways. Okay. So the law is not a faith. The law has no place in the life of a believer. You do not need the law for morality. Second Corinthians chapter three, you have the spirit of Jesus Christ. He will not lead you into sinning. Don't worry. But you don't need a law to tell you not to sin. The law is like a mirror. It just holds up in front of you and it reveals your need for grace with these dirty spots on your face. Does the mirror clean you off? No, it just reveals that you need something to clean you off. And the grace of God cleans you off. You have been cleansed. You have been washed, justified, sanctified. Okay, let's get back on track here. All right. The law commanded Israel to tithe. It was a commandment. You have to do this. You got to give it. All right. Now, um, let's go ahead and get into the first lie. Let's dive deep into this. So the first lie, and I apologize if you're taking that word lie in an offensive way. I'm not meaning it that way. The first lie is Malachi chapter 3. Proves we are to test God with our tithe so that he will bless us. This is a paramount cornerstone passage for those who push the tithe onto the ecclesia. When I say ecclesia, that is the church. The Greek word for ecclesia. The Greek word for church is ecclesia, the body of Christ. Uh, everybody, this living organism, me, you, all of us together. So when we put people under the tithe, based on Malachi 3, we are going back into a letter which was written by a Jewish prophet. Does it belong in the canon of scripture? Absolutely. But it is directed at Israel under the law. So what is the context? The Israelites were going into the storehouse where the grain, the food, the cattle, everything that the Levites had to eat, everything that was used for the festivals, everything that was used to support the poor and the needy and the widows, and they were stealing. They were stealing the food. God was saying, test me in this and bring your whole tithe into the storehouse so that we can eat. <laughs> if you will do this, I will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour, in, pour out an abundance of blessing, which you cannot contain. This is not you giving your money to pastor so that you can get a return on your investment. The word pastor is not there. The first church building wasn't even erected until 600 years later. This is not proof text for you to give money to God to test him so that he will bless you. I'm going to come back to that word test. But what, what are the floodgates of heaven? A lot of people are like, that's, that's just symbolically God will give you a bunch of stuff. Oh, I, I, am, I am living proof. I have given and God has given me back. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. You give him, he gives back to you. I've done that. <laughs> I, I grew up in it. <laughs> but the reality is, according to scripture, God doesn't give that way on this side of the cross. According to the law, yes, because it was a trade-off system. It was a covenant between God and Israel. Test God, and he will open up the floodgates of heaven. That's clouds, okay? Okay. Just, let's just get right to it. That's clouds. Floodgates of heaven. Floodgates of heaven. Think about it. It's rain. 
they were stealing food from the storehouse because they were afraid they weren't going to have enough food to eat. God is saying, bring the food in. I'll open up the floodgates of heaven. You'll have plenty of crops. All right, test me in this. This is not proof text for somebody to say, oh, this is the only part of the Bible where you're allowed to test God. Oh, this is it right here. You, you could just go to this passage right here and you could just, you could test God. Test God. Test him in it. Test him. See if he's not good. Oh, test him. That's pretty convenient. <laughs> pretty convenient. Uh, I can feel myself getting triggered about this. Um, on this side of the cross, we are instructed not to test God. The cross happened. And even before the cross, <laughs> you got to be a Jewish person. You got to be a Hebrew person. You got to be an Israelite. Okay? On this side of the cross, in Acts chapter 15, we are instructed, do not put God to the test. Don't test God. We don't test God. We trust God. All right? Uh, all right. Let's go to... <laughs> Love y'all. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Number two, the second lie about tithing. What is the second one? Okay. The second lie about tithing. Abraham tithed before the law was given, therefore establishing a principle of the time. Oh, I got you right here, McMillan. It says right here. Abraham, he tithed. This was before the law was given, wasn't it? Oh, was it? Was it? Yeah, it was before the law. There, were, there is a principle. You give and God gives to you. Calm down, man. Chill. Why? <laughs> Why? People talk to me like that about this. Uh, all caps. 20 exclamation points. <laughs> I've been doing this social media ministry thing a long time and um, tithing is probably the hottest topic because it gets in people's pocketbooks. <laughs> and when you start telling them the truth about what the Bible actually teaches us about tithing, you know, it's just your stuff is getting messed with. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to lie about it <laughs> according to the Bible. So, you, you know, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Love you. So if we go, if we, where, where, where are they getting this from? Did Abraham tithe before the law was given? Yes. In the book of Genesis. The law hadn't been given yet. We got Abraham. Who's Abraham? Abraham lived before the law. He is the father of many nations. <laughs> Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, the seed of Abraham would come to save the world. That's Jesus. Okay, but Abraham, a man, of, oh, Abraham was a man of a wavering faith. He, there was a, mm, calm down, calm down. <laughs> I'm not getting all angry today, <laughs> triggered. Uh, I read a book one time <laughs> and it's been years. I'm pretty sure the name of the book was uh, An Unwavering Faith or Man of Unwavering Faith. And they used Abraham as unwavering faith. Abraham did not have unwavering faith. God made promises to Abraham, and Abraham had a plan B. You ever heard of Ishmael? <laughs> Hagar? Okay, that's not unwavering faith. The reason why God made a big, big deal and chose Abraham was because he believed him. God has always been interested in one main thing. Do you believe me? If Adam and Eve would have believed God, they would have never wanted the knowledge of good and evil from Satan. So God has always been interested in, do you believe me? So Abraham tithed a person named Melchizedek. This was before the law was given. When Abraham had just gone to battle, killed a bunch of people, took their stuff, he was on the road and he encountered a mystery man named Melchizedek without lineage, a king and a priest. And a priest is simply a representative of, a representative of God. For some reason, Melchizedek was a big deal to Abraham. So Abraham honored Melchizedek by giving him 10% of his spoils of war. That is the context behind the tithe of Abraham. 
So if we go to the book of Genesis and we want to use this as proof text to say, Abraham tithed Melchizedek before the law was given, therefore establishing a principle of the tithe. We can't do that. <laughs> Why? Because Abraham, okay, if you want to use Abraham as your great influence to tithe, you get to tithe once. Because in Abraham's 175 years of life, he tithed once. Not only that, he did not tithe his income. He tithed the stuff he had just taken. Spoils of war. Plunder. <laughs> also, Abraham's tithe was voluntary. Israel's tithe is a commandment. You have to do this if you do not. Abraham was not a faithful tither. Sorry if this just gets in your crawl. Abraham was not a faithful tither. You cannot say, oh, I'm following the principle that Abraham said. Oh, I can just, I can show everybody the stuff. I, I am proof that if you give, God gives. There are countless people who cannot even pay their bills, but yet they give to the penny. Use them as an example, as somebody up on the stage giving a testimony about tithing. God doesn't give to you because you give to him. He gives to you because he loves you. God's blessings cannot be bought. What kind of a father, if I say that, say if, if Grace walked up to me and she said, hey, can I have 20 bucks so I can uh, go to the movies, go out to eat? Well, it's going to be more than that. <laughs> can I have 50 bucks to go to the movies, go out to eat? Uh, and I say, sure, here's, here's 50 bucks. But... You got to bring me back $5. If you don't bring me back $5, you're not getting dinner. What kind of a father would I be? So if me, a human, a created being, <laughs> thinks that way, how much greater does our Father in Heaven give to us? He does not give back to you because you gave him a percentage. He does not use a principle established by Abraham. There are no principles. <laughs> Paul warned against principles of men in the book of Colossians. We do not live by principles. We live by a person, Christ in us and through us and with us. And he is very giving. But it is not a commandment. It is voluntary. And some will say, oh, no, I got you, McMillan. I got you right here, Genesis chapter 14. Jacob tithes. There's another example. Jacob tithes. This was before the law was given as well. Okay, Jacob tithes as well. Just like Abraham, he tithed once to a location named that he named Bethel, which means holy place or house of God, which was a symbolic location of where the actual temple would be. First the tent, then the temple. That temple was destroyed, then another temple, and then that temple was destroyed. This is not an example or a principle of tithing. He did it once. Jacob was not a faithful tither. So if you want to use the example that, nope, I, I, I made a commitment. I made a commitment to God, and when I committed to God, I wrote that check every week, and I can just tell you he blessed my business. My marriage was saved, my kids got off the streets, and I stopped looking at the porn. All because I gave. Hmm. <laughs> Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in any of that? Where's your freedom? Oh, uh, Jesus, oh, Jesus flipped the tables. Yeah, Jesus did flip the tables. Why did Jesus flip the tables? That is the go-to passage for people who want to make Jesus look like he's just a madman. First of all, did Jesus punish anybody? No, he never punished anybody. <laughs> in fact he said I have not come to condemn but to save when Jesus flipped the tables he flipped the tables of the Jewish people who had set up shop in the section of the temple courts which was specifically reserved as a place of prayer for the believing Gentiles because the Gentiles were seen as less than 
So the Jews moved into their space. This is our temple. I don't know what you think you're doing here, Gentiles. Jesus came in, flipped the tables where they were cashing in on the doves and the goats and everything else that they would just take and go into the temple and hand off their animal for forgiveness and then just go off and not show anybody mercy. Jesus flipped the tables, got a whip, and got all the legalists out of there. Because this was the section of the temple where the non-Jewish people who believed Yahweh went and prayed to Yahweh, but you got non-believing Hebrew people setting up shop in their area. That's not Jesus flipping tables because you're selling books in the church lobby. Stop. You can sell books in a church lobby. There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus would go in there and buy a stack of books and hand them out to people. And he'd say, check this book out. Stop it. I am super triggered right now. <laughs> Pump your brakes. Uh, calm down. <laughs> Whew. Okay, let's get back to it. Let's get back to the five lies. Number three, the third lie. Luke eleven forty two and Matthew twenty three twenty three is a commandment from Jesus to tithe. He says it right here in the Gospels. He says it in the Gospels right here. McMillan, what do you have to say about that? He said you are supposed to tithe in Luke chapter 11 and Matthew 23. Relax. What I've noticed over the years is typically when somebody approaches me with this stuff, it's coming like that. <laughs> Just like a, whoa. Like, why are you so upset about this? Why? <laughs> this is freeing stuff. So when we go, first of all, let me just get this out into the open. There is not a single commandment in any gospel or any New Testament letter for anybody to tithe who has believed God. I will repeat that. <laughs> there is not one commandment for anybody who has ever believed God to tithe in any of the gospels or in the epistles. So when we look to Luke eleven forty two 42 and Matthew 23, 23, Jesus is rebuking those who are looking to their tithing for righteousness because they're not obeying everything else. They had to be perfect like God. And they weren't doing that. Remember, if you choose to obey any of the law, you got to do it all. All of it. Or you can repent towards grace. I'm sorry, guys. I got to switch hands again. My hand is frozen. Uh, sorry. If you're listening on the podcast, I am sorry. Hang on. Don't leave me. Don't leave. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I haven't had to do this since I think last January. Normally, even if it's super cold, I can just here you get an extreme close up of my face. Put this on here. Come on. And if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm, I got a little hand towel, little rag here. I put it at the bottom of the phone because if I don't, when I walk, because this is walk talks, the wind hits it, and you can just hear it the whole time. <laughs> when I did my first 15, 20 walk talks, you could really tell. And I bought a microphone that was still crunchy. And then one day I tried a hand towel at the bottom and it works the best. Cause this is not in the studio. I know sometimes you guys are listening to this and it's very studio quality. <laughs> at least I think it is. All right, where were we? Uh, and we're back. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it is cold. All right. So when Matthew or when Luke Blah, 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 blah. When Jesus said in Luke eleven forty two and Matthew 23, 23, uh, you neglect weightier matters of the law. <laughs> you neglect weightier matters of the law. That right there tells you there are different parts of the law which are heavier in regard to their actions. So tithing... This also proves that tithing is a matter of the law. So you got 613 commandments. And if you wanted to obey the 613 commandments, you have to do them all. 
You have to do them all. So just, I'm getting ahead of myself here. How are we instructed to give as the ecclesia, as the body of Christ? Because so many people take this as Matt's telling people not to give. I'm, I never say that. I never say don't give. I say you're free, but people take freedom that way. It's the same with any other action or attitude. When you tell somebody they're free, they take it a certain way because they're applying that to themselves. On this side of the cross, the only section of scripture where we are encouraged to give is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, give out of your abundance. What else does he say? Give freely. Out of your abundance? Freely. What else does he say? From the heart. Give freely from the heart. Now, how can I give freely from my heart if I have a disgusting, deceitful, wicked, sinful heart? See where that goes? So you got double talking the foolish when you have somebody who tells you you have a deceitful heart. But give freely from the heart. You don't have a wicked, deceitful, sinful heart. That is describing an unbeliever. So when you, when you see that, oh, created me a clean heart, Lord. Just created me a clean heart, Lord. Help me. You have a clean heart. <laughs> You've trusted Jesus. Stop asking him for what he's already given you. Okay, unbelievers don't have a clean heart. You have become obedient from the heart. Romans chapter six. <laughs> Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel said, he will remove your heart and give you a new heart. And that has happened. On this side of the cross. So give freely from the heart, not under pressure and not under compulsion. What would compulsion be? A motivational speech to get you to give more money. A testimonial video about how somebody started to give a tithe and a offering above a tithe. And now they got a bunch of stuff. That's compulsion. Okay. Give, but give freely from the heart, not under pressure, not under, under compulsion, out of your abundance. You have God Almighty in you, and he is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. You want to give. You have a heart to give. But there's no magic number, and there's no commandment. You're free. All right, so let's get back to it. Number four, when Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what's God, that's a commandment right there, Matt. First of all, he doesn't say anything about a tithe. The tithe is not there. Now, is he talking about the tithe? I think he is, but he doesn't say tithe. <laughs> He's talking about the law. He's saying the same thing he was saying in Luke 11 and Matthew 23. You guys give to God what you're supposed to give to God according to the law and also give to the government what you owe the government. That's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> this is not a commandment for a Christian to tithe. All right. And then number five, let's get to the fifth lie about tithing. Hebrews chapter seven is in the New Testament epistles and it's a commandment to tithe. I got you right there. There's no commandment in Hebrews chapter seven to tithe. Hebrews chapter seven is about Abraham tithing Melchizedek. I talked about that earlier in the walk talk. Hebrews chapter seven is, sorry, phone froze. Hebrews chapter seven is about Abraham honoring Melchizedek with the tithe. Why? Because the Levites were in Abraham's reproductive organs. <laughs> and Jesus came in the order of Melchizedek. This is hard to understand. I understand. I understand this is hard to understand. So the Levites were priests. They died all the time. Melchizedek was a king and a priest without lineage. Jesus is a king and a priest who will never die. Abraham gave 10% of his spoils of war tithing because that was a way to honor somebody. Therefore, Abraham is saying Melchizedek is greater than himself. Therefore, Jesus, who is like a Melchizedek, is greater than the Levites. Therefore, therefore, the law 
is greater, excuse me, therefore Jesus is greater than the law. Therefore grace is greater than the law. This is about honor. This is about Abraham honoring Melchizedek with the tithe as a picture of Jesus being like Melchizedek, as a forerunner of Melchizedek, who will never die. Therefore, Jesus is greater than the Levites. That's all it's about. Jesus is greater than the Levites. That's it. This is not a commandment for anybody to tithe. Go read it, please. Don't just take somebody's word for it. Read Hebrews chapter 7, and you will see that. And if you want to dive deeper into all these topics, I've done other YouTube videos on the tithe. Um, I've done chapters in my books on the tithe. You can just Google that word and my name, and I dive deep into it. Now, I am done with the five, but I have got... Let me switch cameraman here again. I'm going to try to do this one quicker. Ooh. Sorry, guys. Fumbling around terribly today. Yeah. Hang on. Don't leave. I'm almost done. I got... Okay. Two bonus lies about tithing. I did, a, I did the five. Now let's do the two bonus lies. So two bonus lies. A lot of people will try to throw this in. The widow who gave her two mites set the standard for tithing. No. <laughs> let's talk about that. So in Luke 21 and Mark chapter 12, we see a widow giving her last two copper coins it came out to the total of about a penny okay some some translations say two mites two copper coins but it's a penny and this widow gives that to the treasury at the temple after watching and jesus is watching all this happen after seeing the rich people who had given out of their abundance because again you could trade in if you had too much abundance of grain, uh, grain, fruit, vegetables, spices, cattle, you could trade that in for cash and then you could trade it into the treasury. Well, they would do this as a show out of their abundance. And this lady, this widow gave out of all she had. Now, first of all, did she give 10%? No, she gave all she had. This has nothing to do with being an example as a tither. This has nothing to do with this woman right here gave all she had more than 10%. It, has, it says nothing about her receiving any return on her investment. This is Jesus pointing out these people over here are giving out of their abundance. And this widow, who the tithe is supposed to support, she is giving because she believes Yahweh. All right, let's do one more. Uh, what's the other one? Oh, Acts chapter 5, another bonus lie. <laughs> <laughs> about tithing. Ananias and Sapphira. I got you right here, McMillan. Ananias and Sapphira. This is this proves how serious God is about you keeping your tithe. No, the word tithe is not in Acts chapter 5. This has nothing to do with Ananias and Sapphira tithing. This has to do with Ananias and Sapphira selling some land and then keeping some of the proceeds for themselves. Okay, what happens here? They fall dead. Does it say God kills them? No, it does not say God kills them. They lied to the Holy Spirit, McMillan. The Holy Spirit already knew. He's God, okay? This does not say the Holy Spirit killed them. This does not say they tithed and God killed them for not tithing. If God killed them for not tithing, and if this is how God works, our churches would be littered with corpses every Sunday morning because most people don't tithe. And the ones who do tithe only give about 3%. So we would have to have hearses lined up at every church building because God doesn't work this way. Also, if God killed you for lying about money, what in the heck was the cross was for? What in the heck was the cross for? It doesn't say how they died. In my opinion, I think Peter killed them. If you look at the context, it says they fell dead at the apostles' feet. And Peter tried to kill the guy who was arresting Jesus. <laughs> Peter was called Satan. <laughs> Peter abandoned Jesus. Peter was not the rock. <laughs> I love Peter. I'm sure he was a believer. I'm not saying he wasn't. But Peter struggled with a lot of stuff that everybody else struggles with. Wouldn't eat with the Christians in Galatia. <laughs> so um, I think Peter killed him. So if Peter killed him, did he go to hell? No. If Peter trusted Jesus, no. <laughs> okay. All right. This is not about tithing. So we got to get past that. All right. So 
<laughs> so there's seven lies total. All right, guys. So I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope it has brought to light maybe some lies <laughs> about tithing. Um, you, you know, you're free. And once you understand you're free, you will give in the most organic, natural way possible. This is not going to make you greedy. This is going to make you more appreciative of what Christ has done for you. <laughs> and this is going to help you help people out in a more authentic, authentic way of how God helped you out freely. Not by any work of your own. Not because you owe something. You're not going to give to somebody because they're going to give you something back. You know, if this tithing principle was true, why don't the churches just give to other churches and then give to other churches and then give to other churches and then not bother anybody about the tithe? Do you see how it's just a religious Ponzi scheme? <laughs> you know, we got to get past this and just realize you're free. You're free. Give freely from the heart, out of your abundance, not under pressure and not under compulsion. All right, so I hope this has encouraged you today. Always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous, you're holy, you're blameless, you're a new creation, you're a child of God, there's nothing wrong with you, and you are awesome. I love you too. Always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself.